Board of County Commissioners acts as a quasi-judicial body when it hears requests for rezoning and conditional use permits. Applicants must provide competent, substantial evidence establishing facts or expert witness opinion testimony showing that the request meets the zoning code and comprehensive plan criteria. Opponents must also testify as to facts or provide expert testimony whether they like or dislike a request is not competent evidence. The board must then decide whether the evidence demonstrates consistency and compatibility with the comprehensive plan and the existing rules in the zoning ordinance, property adjacent to the property to be rezoned, and the actual development of the surrounding area. The board cannot consider speculation, non-expert opinion testimony, or poll the audience by asking those in favor or opposed to stand up or raise their hands. If a commissioner has had communications regarding a rezoning or conditional use permit request before the board, the commissioner must disclose the subject of the communication and the identity of the person, group, or entity with whom the communication took place before the board takes action on the request. Likewise, if a commissioner has made a site visit, inspection, or investigation, the commissioner must disclose that fact before the board takes action on the request. Each applicant is allowed a total of 15 minutes to present their request unless time is extended by majority vote of the board. The applicant may reserve any portion of the 15 minutes for rebuttal. Other speakers are allowed five minutes to speak. Speakers may not pass their time to someone else in order to give that person more time to speak. Good evening, everyone. Check. Okay. It is Thursday, October 3rd, 5 p.m., and I'd like to welcome everybody to the planning and zoning meeting. And with that, I'll call this meeting to order. And just ask that you take a moment of silence. Commissioner Tobia. Please stand and join me in the pledge. All right, we have no minutes or resolutions. Consent agenda. I don't have I don't have any cards on this. I have a motion by Commissioner Lober, a second by Commissioner Pritchett to approve consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, I have no public comment cards. So let me make sure. Nope. All right, public hearings. Um, I'm going to move item H7 because there's been a request um, to table. Uh, Madam Chair, the request is to withdraw. Oh, to withdraw? Items, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So we'll go ahead and I'll ask um, Jeffrey Ball, our new planning and zoning manager, will read that into the record for you all, and then the applicant can come up and withdraw the application. Okay. Item H7 is MNR United Inc. Carmen Ferraro applicant requests to change the zoning classification from BU1 General Retail Commercial to BU2 Retail Warehousing and Wholesale Commercial with a BDP Planning Development Plan. The project is located in District 1. Okay. Is the applicant present? Okay. Can you state your name and address for the record? We are here tonight to withdraw the application and I just did want to take a minute and just recognize and thank uh, Commissioner District 1 for all the help trying to make this a reality and the staff was amazing. We all work very hard but in the end it's going to be best to withdraw it so we are withdrawing the application. Okay, thank you so much. Commission, what's your pleasure? Do we need a motion on that? Do we need a motion to withdraw? No. I don't believe a motion is necessary. Okay. I know this is a little confusing having it happen here at the meeting, but, but thank you. I okay. think we, it's clear. All right. Item H1. Applicant is Rocco J. Citeno. 
is requesting approval of a conditional use permit for a private boat dock adjacent to a uh, single family residence in a RU 1 13 zoning classification and a grant of waiver from development standards. Located in District 3 at 425 Ross Avenue, Melbourne Beach. On sep September 9th, 9th, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Board heard the request and unanimously recommended approval. No public comments were provided. Hi, Eddie Dube. Okay. Uh, Lock of Satino, 255, Spoonville Lane, Melbourne Beach, uh, Crystal Lakes. I uh, purchased the uh, boat dock in January. I realized that this particular permit wasn't in place, so I had applied for it, and that's what brings me here today. Uh, it's adjacent to uh, a single family house I, I own in Crystal Lakes. Okay. It's, it's been in existence uh, since the 1990s. And I, I, don't, I don't intend to do any construction or, or change anything. It's, it's pretty much staying exactly the way it is. Okay, great. Commission, have any questions for the applicant? Nope. Thank you. Good. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion to uh, accept the CUP for a private boat dock, Madam Chair. Second. And grant a waiver? Yes, Madam Chair. Second. Okay, Commission, uh, motion by Commissioner Tobias, second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you very much. Item H2 is withdrawn. Item H2 is the one that they're going to table to December 5th. Okay. So we'll moved. I have a motion to table item H2 to December the 5th uh, by Commissioner Lober, second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item H3. Scott um, Merson, applicant, requests approval of a change of zoning classification from medium density multifamily residential to BU1A Restricted Neighborhood Commercial, located in District 4 at 2565 Sellers Lane, Melbourne. On September 9, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Board heard the request and unanimously recommended approval limiting to the office uses only. No public comments were provided. Okay, I'm, go ahead. I'm Scott Merson, and I uh, reside at 2565 Sellers Lane, Melbourne, Florida, 32940. You're the applicant? I am the applicant and the owner of the property. And uh, I also own the Produce Place of Suntree, which butts up to the property. And uh, um, I'm requesting a rezoning for office, uh, professional office services. Nothing retail. I told them we're not going to have ma major traffic there. It's just be basically office professional services. Okay. Does the commission have any questions for the applicant? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good Thank luck. Thank you. Thank you. Item H4. Monica Ellis, applicant requests approval of a change in zoning classification from agricultural residential to suburban residential located in District 2 at 950 North Tropical Trail, Merritt Island. On September 9, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Board heard the request and unanimously recommended approval. Hi, go ahead. Hi, I'm Monica Ellis, the owner and the applicant from 950 North Tropical Trail. Okay. I mean, you don't, you don't have to talk about it because we have it in our packet, but. Oh, uh, change uh, from AU to SR. Okay, Commissioner Lober. I just have one question for staff because I, I didn't get a real firm um, answer when I looked at this during briefings. Has staff had a chance to con uh, convey my question with respect to the natural resources and whether the wetland delineation that was spoken about is sufficient for their for their concerns to address them? Um, Darcy from Natural Resources coming Thanks. up to look at that for you. And for just sure. to bring everyone else up to speed, I I was happy with this. The only thing that caused me any concern at all. Um, was there's a section on page two of the attachment stating natural resources management highly recommends a wetland determination and delineation be conducted before subdividing the parcel. But it looked like some I, yeah, of that may have I, already been done. I, yeah, I had that, and there is no wetlands on that parcel at all. 
Okay, so as, as long as natural resources is happy, I'm happy to move to approve, but. Uh, yes, we, res we are, did receive the report. Uh, one thing that we would do at the time of permitting is ground truth it and make sure that it's accurate. So any, any delineation that's not approved by the state is always open for revision, hopefully not. <laughs> But I just want to put that on the record. Okay. Yeah, I just, anytime I see highly recommend from staff, it kind of causes me just to make sure I have my I's dotted and my T's crossed. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to move to approve it. Second I have a motion by Commissioner Lober, second by Commissioner Pritchett. Commissioner Pritchett? Commissioner Lober, just a quick question, and of course I'll sure. abide with what you want. But I was wondering on this, I don't know if they're hooking up to sewer or not, and they're close to the lagoon. Did you want her to do an enhanced septic? Just, just Bear with thought. me a moment. Yes, sir. And Tad, if I'm incorrect on that, if you guys would jump in, it'd be wonderful. It's just in my reading. One second. It looks, I'm, I'm guesstimating here based on the scale. It says one inch is 2,000 feet, and it looks like it's about three quarters of an inch off. I, I don't know if that's close enough to cause concern for natural resources. I, I'd really defer to staff on this. It, it is in the septic overlay, uh, so you'd have to do the advanced treatment septic okay. at the site. And the other thing that I noted is that when it went before PNZ, it was unanimously approved as well. So I'm still happy with it. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Item H5. And I've got a disclosure on this if you want me to do it now. I do. Or? I have some too as well. I was going to let them introduce it, but go ahead. Sure. Do you have disclosures? Yes, Commissioner, Commissioner Tobias? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. That's good. Want to start okay. up? Go ahead. Uh, other than ones that I've put forward, uh, I met with uh, Ms. Shelley Woods this morning at, in my office at 10 a.m., and we discussed uh, some community concerns with this proposal, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Lober? I've got a handful here, actually a handful plus two that I'll, I'll be giving to the clerk as well to add to the minutes. Uh, on the 15th of this past month, we received an email from Ann Briggs and Henry Beck opposing the proposal as it's presented. On the 25th of September, we had an email from Richard and Susan Courier uh, expressing their concern about the proposal. On the 30th of last month, uh, we have an email that came from Mary Sfar uh, on behalf of Turtle Coast Sierra Club also with some concerns with respect to this and asking for additional BDP conditions. Uh, I believe I responded to that as well, so I ought to note that. On the 30th, same date as the prior email, uh, there was an email that was received from Chelly Woods, president of the MICO HOA, supporting eight homes uh, with certain provisions uh, included. Also on 9.30, an email from Ron Barcher rejecting the proposal or expressing concerns with it in its present form. Uh, shortly thereafter, on 10-2, I have an email that was received from Lisa Soto of MRC uh, requesting the adoption of low-impact development designs. And lastly, on 10-3, the day after, uh, I have an email from David Botto, B-O-T-T-O, of MRC requesting low-impact development approach. Any further disclosures that aren't already submitted? All right. I'll go through my list quickly because Commissioner Lober, I think we were copied on many of those same emails. but. I, um, my disclosures are basically through email um, correspondence. Lisa Soto and David Botto with the MRC expressed their concerns. Chell Woods, and she's the president of the MICO HOA, um, she had uh, requested um, a coastal high hazard area declaration um, as a conservation easement. Uh, Mary and Doug Sparr um, requesting the BDP uh, conditions. Susan and Richard Courier, and Ann Briggs and Henry Beck. All right, go ahead, Ted. This is uh, for item H5, Lazy River Investments, LLC, applicant Bruce Moyer requests approval of a BDP to limit a maximum of eight lots in a RU-1-13 zoning classification located in District 3 at the southwest corner of Fleming Grant Road and Seabird Lane. Uh, the code allows for zoning with smaller lots than the land use allows for as long as the BDP caps the density to the flu designation. So on September 9, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Board heard the request and voted six to one to recommend approval. Public comments were provided. The current proposed BDP does not address those concerns. Uh, the DEO comments that were received 
uh, expressed concerns about the nutrient loading and the impacts to Indian River Lagoon. A portion of the property is within the flood zone A and X, and a portion of the property is within the coastal high hazard area. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Bruce Moy representing the applicant. Um, I'm sure you all remember last time we were here, we were wanting 20 lots on the property and there was uh, a packed room where we um, withdrew the application at the end. So now we're back to you only because we have to. Um, we are not here asking for anything. Um, there, it has a zoning that is existing on the property with the land use that's existing on the property that's incompatible as designated by whoever designated it. Um, by no action of this applicant at all. So the only way to uh, develop it under the least restrictive, or the most restrictive, which is the eight units, which from what I understood was the main uh, topic of that, of that long meeting where everybody says, no, keep it at eight units. So we're proposing to keep it at eight units. Um, we're not gonna change the zoning, we're not gonna change the land use, we just have to submit a BDP so that we can actually develop it with that zoning on that land use. It's just that's, that's what's required by your code. Um, not sure why, but so, what, so by not asking for anything, we're hoping that we're gonna comply with the request to keep it to eight units, and I'm really, really surprised that there's any opposition here at all. Um, I know there's some challenges on this property. It is on the river. We have wetlands. We have aquifer recharge. We have floodplain. We are in the coastal high hazard area. We have surface water uh, classification as an aquatic preserve. Uh, we're in the septic overlay and we have heritage specimen trees. So we have issues that we have to overcome during the development part because we'll have a lot of additional requirements we'll have to comply with. Um, but we will be the only development in that whole area that complies with really any of your code right now. We'll be the only one with a retention system. We'll be the only one that meets all your rules um, all that uh, in that area has been developed a long time ago with basically no rules with direct discharge to the river. Um, so really for eight lots in this, we don't think that, that, that uh, we can overcome the requirements. I think no problem if we can get the approval to move forward. Um, and just for your, for your information, I was looking at that area and along that river from our property, just a little bit west of our property to the um, railroad tracks, there's eight um, undeveloped parcels, vacant parcels, that can build with no, really basically no regulation. So we want to build uh, to our regulation. We are the only, we're, we're only abutting one zoning classification on this property, which is the same zoning that we have to the west. We have right away to the north, right away to the east, and the river to the, to the south. So we're only abutting one property, and that's to the west, which is the same zoning and the same land use that we have. So we would like to develop our property uh, based on your code, your zoning code, and your um, land use code. And just so you know, I think there's gonna be some issue about lot size coming up. Even though the code says you can build a smaller lot, we can't. And not, not because of your code, but because of the state code. The state code requires that if we have well and septic, which we have to be, because there's no water or no sewer in the area, we have to have a minimum of half an acre, minimum. So we will comply with that, as well as all of your codes, and we feel that we're compatible. We'll be developing just like everybody else, except we'll actually be able to treat our water and, and build systems that are up to current standards as opposed to what's happening there now. So I'm gonna let them, I don't know what some of the complaints are gonna be, so I'll let them talk, and then I'll respond uh, once I hear that. Thank you, unless you have any questions. Did anybody have any questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. With your indulgence, I have a couple of them. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moya. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised people are here. I listened to uh, what was said uh, by you, and uh, I do have a couple quick questions. Uh, obviously, it ended in such a way that you were not all that happy walking out. <laughs> and uh, so I do, do have some questions based on your previous comments. Uh, you stated on behalf of the prior applicant that with four lots or eight lots, uh, we wouldn't have any choice to grant it to you that you were, and quote, going to mow down the property and 
end quote, and that, quote, we are going to get rid of the trees. My question to you is, do you, if this is granted, will you still, quote, mow down the property, as you said, and get rid of the trees, as you said, or has that changed? No, that's, that's changed, and I, I don't know if that was taken out of context. I don't think I said we were going to. I said we could under, I think it was possible under, if we just pulled a building permit, we wouldn't be subject to a lot of the land development requirements. Trust me, you do not want me to pull the transcript on okay. this one, sir. Well, if I said that, I was, I was misspoken. Thank you. The first one was misspoken. So let me get to the second one. You stated that if we didn't get it, give it the way you wanted, quote, we are going to have no drainage system whatsoever. Your words. Do you agree that you will have to have in the site plan, which will include drainage now and retention, uh, to show that this uh, development will not cause any harm to the neighbors, or you, do you still stand by your previous statement that you will, quote, have no drainage system whatsoever? No, we will be required to have a, a fully compliant stormwater management system. Okay, so that too has changed. Um, th uh, your next statement that concerned me, you said, quote, we could fill the wetlands in two. If we were to grant you this request, would you be, as you said, filling in the wetlands too? We would know. We would be limited to the amount of wetlands we could fill. We'd be limited to 1.8% of the property, uh, whatever. So 20 acres times 1.8% would be the maximum I'm, I'm, that thank we you, could sir. fill. I, I'm familiar with code. I okay. just didn't think you were with these quotes. So my question is, and this is serious, if we were to do these things, do you understand that should you do any of the plans that you brought last time, quote, filling in the wetlands, having no drainage system whatsoever, cutting down, mowing down trees and property, do you understand that you would be subject to sig significant penalties? Yes, that's okay. why well, we're not Good. proposing that. Anymore. Thank you. Uh, when the current property owner purchased this property, did they know, uh, do that knowing that the flu map would limit development absent uh, a decision of this board? Probably not. They probably bought it knowing that they had a, uh, a one unit per two and a half acres. But I don't think anybody would knowingly know that the zoning on the property was inconsistent with the land use, therefore requiring this meeting to come to have to happen in order to build the eight units. I, I, that seems a little bit in the gray area of, of, of what a, somebody buying property would know or not know. Okay. Uh, so you, you, uh, they became your clients after they purchased the land. Is that yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Uh, we listen to water quality here. My question is, would, be, would you be willing to commit to advanced septic for all eight units, given that this land, as you said, is environmentally sensitive and, again, as you said, close to the lagoon? I, I don't think that that would be fair. Um, you guys passed, I mean, that, that ordinance came up and it was passed and it was decided what properties have to have them and what properties don't. So if we're in that zone, we'd be happy to comply. But if nobody else in the county has to comply, but we are the only ones that have to, that we're not in that overlay district and we'd have to comply with something that people on other properties would not, I don't think that would be fair. Uh, do, uh, I don't think that would be fair. I don't, and I don't know if I'm willing to, to say that at this time. Because if you're not going to make everybody from a certain distance from the river put in that type of a system, why would you make this one? That no would have also worked. Okay. Uh, would you be willing to agree to only put one unit in the coastal high hazard zone? Um, no. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, can I bump this over to Natural uh, Resources? Sure. Thank you. Uh, our comp plan clearly is uh, level has high levels of uh, scrutiny for development in the coastal high hazard zone. What, in your opinion, um, unfettered uh, development in those type of zones it, could we see uh, impacts uh, on our lagoon? Coastal high hazard area designation is more about flooding and risk. It's the storm surge from a category one hurricane. 
So that's more related to uh, vulnerability, develop, vulnerability of the development in that area. So in terms of the Indian River Lagoon quality, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, that coupled with the non-advanced septic systems. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how septic system works, but given the um, designation that that is an area in which flooding could take place, coupled with the fact that they're non-anaerobic systems, do you have any concern with uh, lagoon, lagoon quality uh, water coming uh, that in that proximity given those flood uh, concerns that are on the map? Okay, with regard to the septic systems, uh, the, as Mr. Moy has said, he's located outside of the, um, well, not the whole property, but a portion of the property is outside of that overlay. Um, the board directed when we first established the modeling for the overlay, the board directed us to come back, I think we come back in August, um, we've been doing sampling to, to uh, confirm these distances so they could come back further out we don't know how accurate they are we hope that they're fairly accurate uh, but he is outside of the, the designation right now um, with regard to the lagoon quality uh, depending on how close he gets the, we have the surface water protection ordinance with the 50-foot buffer and if there are any impacts in that buffer he'd be required to provide one inch of uh, treatment or treatment of one inch of water that drains to the buffer. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, other, so Ma Madam I, Chair, yeah. I, I, I clearly understand the distance from the lagoon. Yeah. And, but my question is, is we, had an, we have an added variable in this piece of property. Mm -hmm. That added variable, as I delineated, was this coastal high hazard zone. So when we took into consideration the generic distance to require the advanced septic system, it was not with the variable of the coastal high hazard zone, the fact that there's more likelihood in flooding of that correct. area than other areas. That's correct. So my question is this, and I, okay. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Does that added variable cause additional risk to the lagoon? If there was no coastal, if there was no coastal high hazard zone, this would be a moot point. We've taken, we, we would take it off, off the table, but I'm concerned with the added risk, that could be an added concern, a variable that we didn't take into consideration when we passed the blanket prohibition. Okay, I wanna be very careful about how I say this. Um, the coastal high hazard area does look to be further out than the septic overlay. So yes, that could be a concern, but I cannot, I mean, without additional information, I would hate to make a blanket statement like that. But the answer, I'll just say, there could be a concern, yes. And, 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 I, and I appreciate you saying that you'll wait for the, the data and you expect to get that data back um, that will, uh, I know, we, yes. we, when do you ex expect those assumptions or uh, to be validated? We've been collecting data all along since we initiated the new overlay ordinance. Uh, I think the timeline was to come back to the board to report in August. I mean, we could certainly provide an interim report if, if you wanted to look at something like that to see how the, the distances are shaking out from what we initially modeled. Okay, and did you take into account the variable of the likelihood of flooding or did, was it just merely the distance from the lagoon? Oh, the, the modeling done, was done by a subcontractor and they took into account groundwater, floodplains. I mean, she. Her modeling way over my head a lot of different um, factors in there so but it's still modeling perfect. with the best available data and we're collecting more data to confirm the the distances so we, we would uh, thank you madam chair for your so we would have a an answer one way or another uh, definitively whether or not that that would impact uh, water quality but we won't know till August Correct, unless there's been additional modeling in that area already, and unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that. I can certainly talk to Virginia and find out if we have more information on that. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, and sorry for the vagueness of my question. Uh, no, my that's questions. okay. <laughs> Just trying to be careful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Lober? I'm just trying to get a better grasp in terms of the septic issue here. With respect to the, the septic tanks, are you able or 
more aptly, I should probably say, are you willing to perhaps move them further up the property to get them further away from this coastal high hazard area? Is that something that's possible? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't foresee putting any septics within that zone. Um, obviously, we would do everything we could to avoid that. It's costly, it's cumbersome, it, it's, it's not something that's desirable. So we would obviously design to avoid that. Just like we're going to design to avoid the coastal high hazard area and all the other um, things that are on this property that we have to I appreciate comply it. with. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I kind of have the same concerns Commissioner Tobia does because you gave us this BDP last time when we were, we were going to try to run through the other thing. And you listed in there uh, about the enhanced septic and um, you put no more than one structure in the coastal high hazard area. And you also had a little bit of about the trees. You really put together a very responsible BDP. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, that night, I think you had the votes to go ahead and, and do this um, zoning with your BDP. So um, I'm, I'm probably favoring what Commissioner Tobia was going through with you also, sir. And um, so um, maybe if you have some time to think through that, because you were already willing to do a lot of these things before. And as far as the septic, you know, I, I get all that, but you know, we're enhancing the um, density on the property. And I, even when we did this, I kind of want to, I if I could get away with it, I'd make everybody do the enhanced septic right now. Because I think a lot of the money we're paying right now is because of the leaking se septic systems. And you can see a lot of that, um, what's the word I'm looking for, evidence because they're the places closest to the water that we have the most amount of problems. So I, I think moving forward, and I mean, I mean, we started with this step, but I, I think we have a lot of work to do. So I'll be interested after I hear public comment and what everybody has and, and your argument, sir. But um, I, I really was hoping you'd come back with this, with this, and, and I was gonna be happy. And I know you had a, you had a very hard emotional time last time, but um, it looks like we're, we're trying to get somewhere, but I, I'm still kind of favoring what Commissioner Tobias said, and you kind of dropped it all in my head too, so. Yeah, and I apologize for that. I, I think I was um, not thinking clearly at the end of that meeting. Um, that was a lot to uh, absorb. I apologize for that. But we were asking for a lot then, and we were willing to give a lot to get a lot. Um, and I really feel that we're not asking for anything. Well, um, we're, we have we're the, the taking your density, your dots from two and going to eight if we do. So there, there is quite an ask here. So I, I think we're probably going to end up with some type of compromise maybe tonight. I don't know. But um, again, in all fairness, you kind of threw this out. So um, I, I really hear what um, your commissioner is saying. And um, so. All right. Okay. We can call you back up after Thank we're you. done if you want to rebut any of uh, these comments. And I have several comment cards. But just keep in mind the rules of public hearing and quasi-judicial that if your comments aren't I just don't want the development. Your comments have to provide evidence to why it's not, or provide, um, you know, valid claims to your testimony in essence. So with that, David Montgomery, and you'll get five minutes. And after David Montgomery, Robin Carroll. And if you just state your name and address, or name and city, would be great. Uh, uh, David Montgomery, Palm Bay, Florida. Um, I do not recommend approval of the H-5 binding de development plan based on lack of information um, of an approach for compliant stormwater management. Um, zoning meetings in February and May discussed having a state-of-the-art stormwater system for the property, but among multiple methods or a combination of them, none has been identified and no concept has been suggested. There's many ways to do stormwater management, and whether it's a retention pond, a combination of several other things, that's, it's not clear to me. I worry about the process going further and then variances being requested because um, of the way the property's laid out, um, having to account for um, the trees, the coastal high hazard easement, and preserving um, I, I can't see building in the um, coastal high hazard zone. There's clearly going to be floods there. They can fill that in, but people are going to be in trouble 10 years from now when higher, um, in this case, Sebastian River levels will be e e eating into the properties up to, say, four feet by 2040. So 
Um, it is true that many properties in the area have stormwater flooding and um, septic tanks on the river. That's not, that doesn't make it okay for this property to um, not address those issues, but I don't see any concept plan in the um, BDP. The previous BDPs and the, the one proposed in the May 24th zoning meeting did talk about a number of things. I think uh, Ms. Pritchett brought that up is that there were quite a number of um, uh, advanced septic things identified, um, preserve the wetlands, um, uh, something else here, a number of things, but they seem to have disappeared in this new um, BDP, maybe just um, as a matter of unhappiness with the last results. But uh, in my case, uh, I am worried about the stormwater management not being defined and um, uh, if we go past this BDP plan, I'm not sure that they'll be able to be compliant without some sort of concept um, presented. Oh, and that's all I have. Thanks, you. Thank you, sir. Robin Carroll, and after Robin, David Bato. My name is Robin Carroll. I live at 9575 Fleming Grant Road in Mico. Uh, I understand that uh, the 20 acre property can support eight homes. If all of those acres are buildable, well, with this property, that may not be so. Two and a half acres are a prudent average to build a home. And we need to keep any development and all future development on sensitive waterfront properties or not. We need to meet low impact development criteria. In today's world, where our natural waters and environment are suffering from self-inflicted developmental wounds, we must put the brakes on to preserve our neighborhoods for the future. If environmental issues cause some of the land to stay undeveloped, so be it. Being an AE flood zone, and having acres of high coastal hazard area, the prudent need to contain storm runoff may reduce the build ability on this property. I do not know how they plan to situate eight homes on this acreage, and how a decision like this can be made today is questionable. I do, I do know that advanced ETU septic systems is a must and requires a minimum of a half an acre. I have a problem with this, that lot size in my community. However, the arrangement must fit a low density impact development. Not one home in my neighborhood has been built on less than an acre in 30 years. All this, and this needs to move forward for our environmentally challenged waterfront area. We must consider climate change and environmental preservation in any future development plan. Violating land use plan may not be a good idea. That plan was set for a reason in 1988. And what makes this development so special and so important? No matter what the technology and septic is today, it does not justify a change to the land use plan. Soil is key. Sandy soil allows for seeping directly into the river. Septic is the smoking gun on lagoon quality. Advanced treatment units st still will fail if flood waters, if waters flood the drain field. Old homes in the existing neighborhoods will be flooded with each rain. Modern homes are built up on mounds these days. All properties will drain onto lower, older homes. Can we really think we control all the stormwater runoff? Water does seek its own level. You can't stop it. It's arrogant to think you can. Our neighbors will be flooded, no matter how these homes are situated. There needs to be enough permeable land surface to absorb the runoff. This alone should be enough to keep the 1.2.5 requirement or better 
or better, have a plan to show us how you plan to deal with this. We have no plans. We know, we know nothing of how this is going to get done. Thank you. Thank you. David Bato. And after David Chell Woods. I'm David Bato. I live in Indian Harbor Beach, and I'm here for the Marine Resources Council. You've gotten a couple of uh, correspondence from us. I just want to elaborate on those a little bit. We have a population growth that's unbearable. We need development. We know that. It's not just needed, it's necessary. But development that's taking place now is being done under requirements, legal requirements that they can follow, but they do, do not address the lagoon. You had an example of that just a few minutes ago in discussing a high hazard area. The high hazard area regulations do not directly address surface water quality. It's not in there at all. That's true of many of our LDRs. Those need to be changed. They urgently need updating. Business as usual will continue to harm the lagoon. We've got to make those changes. Low impact development is the answer. It is a fairly simple concept that is based on holding the water, the storm water at the site by reducing and minimizing impervious surfaces, providing storage and capability for uh, percolation and evaporation of the water on the site so you do, do not need a costly stormwater transportation and storage infrastructure. It is quite widely used in Florida now. Globally, it has been used for years. Several of communities in Florida have adopted it. Sarasota, Pinellas, Duval, Orange, uh, Jacksonville, Cocoa Beach are adopting uh, low impact development and have written and published uh, best management practices for the low impact development approach. We know that's gonna take a while to do it here. We are asking you to, to adopt that, but in this case, this MICO property is critical to the lagoon. Uh, we were here before on that when you uh, denied an increased density request. It drains directly into the St. Sebastian River as it empties into a lagoon aquatic preserve of impaired water. It is, at this time, impaired. At least five state agencies in writing uh, have indicated to you the criticality of this uh, property. And you did take action the last time I was here before, before you. Uh, it's in, the development now, which will be done and should be done, must be done in a way that doesn't harm the lagoon. And runoff is a problem. Runoff remains one of the primary sources of pollution in the lagoon. We need to do low impact development to prevent that from further harm. Uh, it, and, and, and actually it would be in violation of federal and state mandates as indicated in our basin, basin management action plan. If you allow new development to add to the pollution in the lagoon. There are some low hanging fruit that apply to this property that uh, would be fairly simple and easy to apply. Um, locating the property close to the main transportation artery, artery so that you reduce the uh, street impervious surface access road into the, to the area of development. Compacting the development to reduce the footprint. The impervious surface put, footprint is important. Uh, On-site vegetated swales the retention of trees, they all help and they all work to that final objective that when you finish the development, the runoff from that property is no more than it was before you started. That's the first objective of LID. Now we've, we've recommended a pretty dramatic thing. I agree, I realize that. Maybe it's naive, but we wouldn't recommend this 
if this were an out-of-state developer. This is a local developer. He lives here with his family. We're counting on the fact that he is as interested in restoring our lagoon to its beauty as we are. We are recommending that you negotiate a low impact development with this developer to apply reasonable, low impact, best management practices to this development. They are, they're easy, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, the Marine Resources Council offers our assistance, our help to okay. both parties if you carry through this. Thank you. I think it may be Shell Woods, is that correct? Or is Chelly? Oh, okay. Shelly. Yes. Oh. Thank you. I'll remember that next time if you That's come okay. again. Oh, I hope we don't have to keep doing this. <laughs> okay, so I am Shelly Woods. I am president of Mico Homeowners Association. I live at 9912 Riverview Drive in Mico. And I'm happy to be here, and I'm so happy that you all were very thoughtful with your decision on May 30th. The reason that we're here today is because the May 30th BDP that we saw was pretty good, but we don't have one now. All it says is we have eight homes. So we're worried and we're concerned because our focus is still the Indian River Lagoon through the St. Sebastian River, and we want to limit contaminants. So we have some issues, one of them being the coastal high hazard area, and we suggest that perhaps there be no homes there because of the fact that it is um, an intake of the category one storms. And any of us that have been here for a while know that we've got a lot of storms and we've had some category twos and threes that we've had to handle. So I don't know what would happen to the homes there. The objective seven of the coastal, of, of the Brevard County coastal management element says to limit the densities in coastal high hazard, hazard areas and in fact direct the development outside of a coastal high hazard area. We also would like to see no fill dirt in the AE flood zone, which is also the coastal high hazard area, basically. Um, the NAVD basic um, uh, flood elevation says, or base level flood elevation says that it needs to be 5.3 feet. Well, to me, that sounds like a mound. I'm 5'5". Five five. So right here to my shoulders, you know you have this big mound of dirt and then a house needs to sit above that even. I just can't imagine several hills of these mounds in the AE flood zone. Um, our next concern is we need advanced septic. We have advanced septic nowadays. It's available. There's no reason not to use it, especially because we are in such close proximity to the St. Sebastian River and the Indian River Lagoon eventually. Um, St. John's Water Management made that statement in their comments. So did the Department, Department of Environmental Protection, and so did the Department of Economic Opportunity. Stormwater is a big problem as well can't have obviously stormwater management be right there in the coastal high hazard or the flood zone. So it would have to be upland somewhere. Um, we hope that there is a viable stormwater management system going to be in place on this BDP. Rarely do I come up with complaints when I don't come up with some kind of a solution. So my solution to the whole thing is keep the homes upland, clear the um, coastal high hazard area, and perhaps create boardwalks that go through there so that all the eight residents that own all the eight homes can enjoy coffee in the morning, cocktails in the evening, on their way down to their docks that are probably going to be there so they can get into their boats. This way you'd be preserving the trees You'd be giving the residents a beautiful little place to visit. It's only about five acres. It would make a nice little uh, conservation area. And that way, this development might become a wonderful thing. And everybody would say, oh, look at what they did. What a good job they did. And I'd rather have that happen. So thank you so much for having me. Commissioner Lober? After everyone's done, if I could. OK. All right, Mary Spar, and after Mary, Terry LaPlante.
excuse me, is the clock supposed to be running? I guess so, right? The clock's running because okay. you're taking up time because you oh, could have given us this before the no meeting. No problem. Okay. Name and address, please. Mary Spar, uh, Coco. I'm speaking for Sierra Club. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll get right to the point. And on this chart, um, you'll see a comparison with current um, bonding development pr plan that's proposed and the one on May 30th, which you've been discussing, and then our recommendations uh, for the current BDP. And you'll notice, of course, that the current proposed BDP does not limit the number of residences in the coastal high hazard area, um, and only would have conventional septic except in the overlay, and there's no preservation of the specimen oaks um, required by the BDP. Um, yet on May 30th, as you noted um, earlier, the applicant did agree to one primary, only one primary residence in the coastal high hazard area to advance septic throughout and the preservation of the specimen oaks. So we are recommending no residences in the coastal high hazard area because this time he only has eight homes to fit on the property, not 16, and he'll have a lot more flexibility. We're recommending advanced septic, and I'd like to read you um, from the DEP letter. Conventional septic systems near coastal estuaries remain a significant contributor of nitrogen and phosphorus to these water bodies. In order to avoid the exorbitant cost of restoring nitrogen and phosphorus pollution problems in the future, any new nearby septic systems, especially those clustered on small lots, one acre or less, should be built to remove nitrogen dis before discharge. The department supports the use of the nitrogen reduction overlay and strongly encourages the county to require these types of enhanced treatment OSTDS on the entire site due to the proximity of the IRL. We have a similar comment also from the Water Management District. The district recognizes the county's implementation of the NRO and encourages the county to require enhanced treatment OSTDS on the entire parcel because of the proximity to the IRL. So that's state speaking. Um, our final um, priority that we would like is the preservation of the specimen oaks. And we've chosen our, um, our uh, Rec prim primary recommendations carefully um, based on the comprehensive plan or um, the state comments. Um, our three, DP three requested BDP additions confront and address a crucial fact. The fact is there is no good way to develop as usual clear cut and fill in the coastal high hazard area and protect the Indian River Lagoon at the same time. Can't be done. In order to raise house pads in the coastal high hazard areas to 6.3 feet NAVD, a huge amount of fill would have to be brought in. Even if the specimen oaks and other trees were not victims of clear cutting, putting several feet of fill on their roots would kill them, and their service of absorbing stormwater runoff would be gone. Um, we're asking you um, to please add these conditions. And remember, you do not have to approve an inadequate BDP. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Do we have this? In. Did you get a copy? Okay. All right, Terry. And after Terry, Jacob Zader. Zander. Good evening, Terry LaPlante, Melbourne, Florida. I'm speaking on behalf of Trees for Life Brevard. 
our mission is to preserve, protect, plant, and plant native trees in Brevard through direct action and education to create an awareness of trees as a vital environmental resource for our community and quality of life. We call upon the commission to take responsibility for the long-term health of the Indian River Lagoon by protecting the trees within the coastal high hazard area. By protecting the trees, you protect the lagoon. The protection of the CHHA will also protect our most important trees, our specimen trees. The subject property is located on the St. Sebastian River, which is part of the Indian River Lagoon. The shoreline of trees and other plants prevent erosion, reduce stormwater runoff, reduce the nutrients and contaminants being washed into the river, and provide a living shoreline for sea life and wildlife. Additionally, tree canopies provide shade to cool the river and thus reduce the potential for algae blooms. Trees take up hundreds of gallons of water, reducing the potential for flooding and reducing the damage caused by major storms. The National Arbor Foundation cites studies that for each dollar invested into a city's tree yields five and a half dollars in economic benefits. The cost benefits to a community are most visible as concerns the cost of stormwater management and the prevention of flooding. There is also sufficient evidence to support the case that green neighborhoods not only enhance the quality of life for the residents, but that these properties sell at premiums, giving the developer an incentive to take the extra time and effort to develop a green, low-impact community. As indicated in our mission statement, it is our intention to educate the community on the value of preserving and protecting trees, especially specimen trees. Specimen trees need to be kept as there aren't any sufficient ways to mitigate the loss to community and to wildlife, especially birds. Specimen trees are sometimes referred to as untouchable. For certain species, like the live oak, provide food and habitat for over 500 types of butterflies and moths, which are the food source for 96% of the bird population. What we have seen time and time again when builders have attempted to keep trees they often don't survive. Sometimes they are fatally damaged by the heavy equipment rolling over the roots. Sometimes it's the building being placed too near the tree, and then there is the issue of trees being doomed when fill is needed to raise the elevation of the property. There are other reasons to protect trees besides protecting the river and the lagoon. Trees canopies prevent heat islands. Trees sequester carbon dioxide, reducing the heat associated with climate change. Trees improve water quality by um, intercepting pollution. Clear cutting denies the homeowner the health benefits provided by trees. Trees provide shade that cools the neighborhood, making it safer for being outdoors and being physically active. Trees reduce air pollution and provide oxygen critical for life. Shade trees also reduce the energy cost of cooling a home. There have been many studies, including one provided by the US Forest Service, citing the positive effects <coughs> trees have on mental health, calming, reducing stress, increasing the ability to focus, increasing energy levels, and improving mood. Other health benefits include reducing blood pressure, boosting the immune system, and improving sleep. We have allowed clear cutting for the sake of growth for too long and have destroyed the key, key tree canopy of Brevard and the health of the Indian River Lagoon. It is time to consider the needs and protect our health and our quality of life by keeping the trees that protect us. According to the St. John's Water Management District, the Indian River Lagoon is an economic engine generating 7.6 billion to Florida's economy annually. We request that the CHHA be protected and preserved from any development other than hiking paths, bike paths, playgrounds, fishing docks, kayaks, launch areas, et cetera. We urge you to protect the specimen trees and the Indian River Lagoon. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob Zender? Close, Zender, yeah. Zender. Jacob Zender, O'Galley, Florida, 32935. Um, I do have some slides, so I don't know if we can get those up. Perfect. Have they already reviewed you? Know? Have they been? Okay. Did, did you submit it for yeah. review yet? or? Because you would have to, to Space Coast TV. Okay. I okay. have no idea. 
As long as we have them. I, I just wasn't clear that we okay. had them. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm not going to try and cover too much of what's already been said, but I did want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak tonight, Commissioners. And really, I did want to highlight that um, Commissioner Tobai has already stated a number of the concerns that have been addressed here uh, by speakers. Um, to just remind everyone where we're talking about, um, we're at the very south end of Brevard County, Sebastian Inlet is right here, a nice saltwater access for us. And then we have the nice freshwater tributary here with the St. Sebastian River. And the parcel in question is outlined here in red. Nice 20 acre parcel adjacent to the St. Sebastian River Preserve State Park. So uh, if we look at some of the resources that are in that area, uh, FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, put out a report in 2007 uh, talking about where we have existing oyster reefs. Um, so the, the Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan is spending potentially $10 million over 10 years to restore oysters. And here we have an area where FWC is identified as one of the last and or only places in Brevard County with existing oyster populations. Uh, and there's one of the regions, the south region there, identified in yellow, and the parcel again identified in red. So all the little yellow shapes on this portion of the St. Sebastian River are portions of oyster reef. Um, so oysters are a brackish water species. They like that mix of fresh and salt. So they get the, the salt water, of course, during high tide when the ocean water comes in from Sebastian Inlet, and they they get a nice freshwater flush from the Sebastian River when that's up and the tides are down. So this is a great area, and one of the reasons why we still probably have oysters there is because of the low development along the St. Sebastian River. Um, the May uh, proposal uh, had the concern of adding too many units, but relatively good environmental considerations, and now we kind of have just flip-flopped. We're kind of on the right path again for density, and we just threw all the environmental stuff to the wind. So uh, it's fun looking at aerial maps, but this is actually what the site looks like from the water. Um, so we have nice, big, old live oak trees here. Uh, we have white mangroves along the edge, one of the things that's funded by you know the, the Save Our Lagoon plan. Um, we, of course, have um, some native grasses, we have sable palms, the state tree of Florida. I mean, this, this is a beautiful riparian edge right here at the end of the property, which could be protected and, and made as a beautiful centerpiece to these eight units. So um, we're in line with the, the other speakers, um, limit this to the eight units that are proposed with advanced septic so that we're not just running nutrients down here into the St. Sebastian River. Uh, keep the specimen oaks and stay out of the coastal high hazard area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, Linda Barrett, La last but not least. <clears throat> okay, so Linda Barrett's passing. All right, um, Bruce, would you like to come up and rebut anything or did commission have questions beforehand? Some comments, I can go before or after Mr. Moya. It's up to you. Would you, would you rather go, go before ahead. or after? Go ahead. Okay, so I, I had a, a couple of questions that were brought up, I believe, by Mr. Botto with MRC. Um, he had indicated that if we allowed new development to add pollution, which I take to mean any pollution of the lagoon, that we would be violating some federal mandate. Are you aware of whether that's the case, Ms. Bentley? No. I don't know which code he's referring to. Nor am I. I appreciate that. Also, is the particular locale or residence of a developer a factor that we can lawfully consider in approving or denying such requests? You need to consider the land use only. So it's not a lawful factor? No. I appreciate that. Um, and just the final comment for Mr. Moya. I don't know whether I'm going to support this or not today. I really don't have a clue at this point. Um, but I, I can tell you, I think that uh, obviously the last meeting was frustrating for you. Um, I think it was visibly frustrating for a lot of folks. The problem is that the BDP that you proposed for the prior meeting is now, right, wrong, or indifferent, forming the basis that a lot of folks feel entitled to. So I'm interested to see how it works its way through with the discussion here. But it's, it's unfortunate because I do think you went above and beyond for the prior meeting. I think there's some good things that have been suggested by folks. Um, but 
one of the things that comes to mind is anytime we're doing something for the benefit of the lagoon or the benefit of a particular area, I don't like subjectivity. I don't like things being done in an arbitrary fashion. And if we have an overlay that says this particular area needs advanced and this particular area doesn't need advanced, I do tend to agree with you that it's not fair to start imposing requirements arbitrarily on you with respect to that. If you went ahead and volunteered to do that, that would be lovely. I would love to see that. Um, I think that would probably increase your chance of getting this passed tonight to an extreme degree. Um, but I, I don't think it's fair for me to force you to do that. Um, there are a lot of things that, that people have identified they, they want to see remain constant with this land. That's great. There's an undeveloped lot next to me, between me and the river. I'd love if it never gets developed, but it's not my entitlement and it's not my place to say, you can't develop that, I want it to stay the way it is. So I, I do empathize with, with your position. Um, all I can tell you is regardless of how this goes, uh, I, I hope it works out in some fashion for you that this is developable. Um, I, I just don't know that anything that you could have said this evening would have been acceptable to some folks. I think other folks have more reasonable concerns, but some folks I think essentially want this left be and you know, hands off and it's, it's for the benefit of humanity. But unfortunately, fortunately or otherwise, people have a right to do to a degree what they want to do with their land. So best of luck to you. I'll come back up. Thank you for that, Commissioner Lover. Um, yeah, after hearing all that, I'm not sure I could support it either. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Um, do I agree with a lot of it? Absolutely not. Um, I think there was a lot of stuff, as you pointed out, that is, I don't believe was uh, completely factual, uh, as probably some of my testimony the first time I came up here. Um, and I apologize for that if I was out of line. Um, clearly, I'm not prepared for this level of, of opposition. I uh, did not expect this. I didn't even get anything um, except by email uh, yesterday or a couple, maybe a couple of days ago earlier this week that there was even any complaints out there. I mean, three people showed up at the P&Z and the P&Z approved it. We didn't hear anything that we thought was of any concern. Uh, it was mostly talk about lot size. So we were here prepared to talk about lot size and maybe some compromise with that. But now they're throwing the kitchen sink at it. This, all their comments are applicable to every development in Brevard County. And that's hard for me to sit here and say, we could do this or we could do that. Your code applies to every development in Brevard County. And we, we, we are more than willing to, to adhere to all your codes and those that are even above it. That's why we thought when we submitted this, we thought we were just gonna submit what we thought we were entitled to. When he bought the property, he bought it fully believing and being told that he could get eight units on it because it had a land use and we're talking land use. We're not changing the land use. I heard somebody say we're changing the land use. We're not. We're keeping it the same because that was what the request was, that he was entitled to do eight units. I do this every day. I used to work for the county and I had no idea that if a, if a zoning was inconsistent with the comp plan that you were limited on how many lots you could put on there. With the, I thought the land use prevailed or whichever one was stricter prevailed. And usually the land use is more strict and the zoning is more lenient, which is the case here. So we, I thought if you comply with the land use that you wouldn't even need to be here to get a BDP to build uh, on a lot that had a land use that was what we have here. Um, I mean, they have a lot of concern about this property. Uh, I don't really understand it, to be honest with you. There's, for eight properties that we're going to put, there's eight other properties are going to do worse than what we're going to do if they ever buy those lots and build a house on them. They're not going to have any retention. They're going to have a, set, a conventional septic tank system because they're not in the overlay district. If you go to the other side of the railroad tracks, within the same distance we are from the river, there's countless vacant lots that can be developed on septic, on conventional septic with no stormwater treatment system. So who's really hurting the river here? Is it gonna be us with our eight homes that we're gonna comply with the latest and greatest standards and put in the, a state-of-the-art stormwater management system that has to, by code, by law, reduce the amount of, of pollutants to the water? It's required, that's, that's the way the code reads, that's the way the St. John's Water Management District makes it happen. So we would be the only development in this area that would actually reduce the amount of pollutants going to the river. Um, I'm stunned, uh, really, I, I really am. Um, 
if we have to, if we're only limited to one structure in the coastal high hazard area, so be it. If that's your code. We have to comply. I don't know that that's, I don't know, I'm not that familiar with that requirement. Uh, Commissioner Tobias, when you said something about one unit, it's one unit to me means like the lot itself. So saying keep the lots out of that. I don't think that would be fair because obviously you want lots with river frontage. Whether we build a structure in there or not, and if we're not allowed, we won't. Subdivisions, we don't design structures when we do subdivisions. That's all done at the building department level with the home buyer. That, that's not what we do through your land development regulations. That's, that's, that comes after. So we're just asking for what we really feel we're entitled to. Um, we did ask, we were gonna offer a lot. We were asking for a lot. We were asking for 12 more units and to make the project viable, offering all that, we needed the 12 units to offer you everything that we were gonna offer you. Now that we're gonna just comply and just do it exactly the way the code says it, so the way the land use says it has to be done, the way your code says it has to be done, we just want the right to build and do what everybody else in the county does. Um, nothing different. Um, and, to, and to impose additional requirements for meeting your requirements, I, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. Um, and that, this whole septic thing is really new and the, the science was brought to the board and you guys made a decision. You made a good decision. You said this is good for the whole county. So I would hope if it's good for the whole county, it's good for us too. And we're more than happy to comply with that. Um, so uh, if, if we're at an impasse here and we need to go back to the drawing board, I, I would appreciate um, the opportunity because uh, this level of, of opposition was a complete surprise to us. And I, I just really don't understand it. I really don't. So if I, I'll answer any questions if you have them. Commissioner Tobias, did you have a comment or question for the applicant? Okay, did anybody have any questions for, for Mr. Moya? Okay, I, I have a question. Um, I know we discussed, you know, when you talked about the advanced septic systems and the, that was when you were asking for 12 units, is that correct? I know you said that. We were asking for 20. Or 20, I'm sorry, yeah. 12 additional units. Yes. So, and we discussed this, and I guess like it would be very difficult to go back and explain it all now, but we talked about the manage, a stormwater management system and how it can actually be more efficient with the higher density. Now, I'm not suggesting you go back and ask for higher density. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, you're able to put in the, the proper stormwater management because you don't have these, you know, random lots at two and a half acres. So I think the concession was at two and a half acres, but it, it actually can be more detrimental and more difficult to manage water with, with those, you know, sparse units. Is that mm -hmm. correct? correct? I mean, you being an engineer. I mean, it, it has to meet the requirements, it, right. but you're right. A, a larger lot like a two and a half acre is hard because how do you get the water to get somewhere if, uh, except for grade the entire lot and start tearing trees down? And I that mean, has to do so, with a lot with retention too because you're, yeah. you're able to put in more retention ponds and stuff like that and, and, and more canal systems and, and something that's a little more dense, correct? Right, and, and with this, we could, with what you guys, with, with the zoning that's on in the land use, we could create a lot of open space where we wouldn't even build in it. Okay. We would have that flexibility. I think that was the only question that I had. Again, I okay. think it would be, it'd be like a whole engineering class on how to explain how, how stormwater works, but I get it. And maybe it's because I've been doing this a while too, but I understand. So I think that that was maybe where some of that discussion got lost, mm -hmm. you know, because again, you can, and you don't like to look at it this way, but if the profit made on 20 units compared to just doing eight is able to, to make the developer or the investor afford those units. I mean, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. No additional questions for Mr. Moya? Okay, Commissioner Tobias, I think we're done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I honestly, uh, very rarely do I ever come to a, a meeting without an idea of which way uh, I was going on this. I certainly had met some folks from the area uh, today as I disclosed, but um, after testimony, here, here's where I stand. Again, I respect everyone for their opinion on, on that. Our comp plan um, says that we need to pay uh, special scrutiny to any construction that happens in the coastal high hazard area. I just pulled up 
coastal high hazard area the Florida Department of Economic Ar Opportunity clearly states that uh, we need to limit uh, uh, coast we need to limit development in coastal high hazard areas section 163 um, we've heard from the Natural Resources Department that there is a lack of research on septic tanks that are in the coastal high hazard area and it may be detrimental and we're going to get an answer to that um, but i think it would be um, premature for us not knowing that and spending millions of dollars on the the lagoon even a little bit uh, would set a, a very bad precedent i understand where mr moya is coming from where he said treat us uh, like every every other area but Unfortunately, this is not every other area. This is unique. This is specific. This is within the coastal high hazard area, as not only he has presented, but certainly the homeowners have. And short of no commitment for uh, advanced septic, I think it would be premature for me to uh, grant uh, the request at this juncture so um, I, I would be more than willing to look at it again when the research ca came came through uh, I guess it sounds like August uh, and if we had any preliminary preliminary data that we found was reliable I certainly would be willing to do it at then but without any research and hearing from our natural resources department that it is uh, potentially could be hazardous I'm not comfortable with supporting it at this juncture Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, ma'am. Just a, a couple of, of thoughts. If, if other people do build, they do have to manage their own stormwater when they're getting their permitting done through the county. So it's not like other people can build on lots and, and just, just have a heyday with not taking care of their own stormwater. So there was a couple of things I just want to say out there in case the community is listening, thinking that we don't have any kind of... Um, ability to uh, help with, with the projects we're trying to do. A, a couple of thoughts here, and I, and I really feel for the builder right now having to go through all this. And um, from what I heard tonight, I really didn't hear a lot of opposition. I think everybody's agreeable to the eight. It's just some of the parameters that, that wrap around it. <laughs> and so I, I think maybe if, if you spend a little bit of time here and, and meet with your commissioner's office and work on some things here, that um, we can work through because here's the goal is to cause no harm and mr. Moya you had said you know with with him buying it thinking you could do this but you should always know when you buy something and you sign a contract that that's what you're buying and you can hope to come along and change it but I mean I mean we're all smart enough to know that and so here's the thing and I, again last time if we would have done this with the eight units it would have been a done deal because we had negotiated all through it got to a place where we, we thought it would be responsible at that time so it's not so much that i'm holding you to your bdp but man we beat this dead horse last meeting and i got to a place of comfort to where i thought now a few of these things in here might not be necessary i don't think you need to form a homeowners association and, and there's some of those items but with the um, additional septic, and, and again, I'll be waiting to hear what Commissioner Tobia comes back with later, but these are going to be four and $500,000 homes. I'm not sure an extra 10000 to upgrade the septics are going to be that bad. And these are going to be beautiful homes. And when you uh, build the maybe one, or one home on the high coastal hazard area, you can put it on stilts. So I don't know if you can do more than one. You might be able to do more than one. I don't know. But there's ways to come back with some creative thoughts when you're making your plans. But um, there's a couple things that were in the other one that I, I realize might be good things, like the um, base flood elevation is changing to the 5.3. And you kind of brought that up the last time. So that might be something you want to look at. The high coastal high hazard area, I think that's something we need to work through. The oak tree seemed to be a big deal, but you had that in the BDP last time that you thought that that was significant to you, that you would be careful with those and, and do some um, processes to help preserve the significant ones. And um, we talked about a few of those. You had in your BDP about the wetlands that you were going to take care of the impact and not impact more than 0.37 acres. So I, I think if you work through this, I, I think you'll find some things that, that might be okay. Again, I didn't hear a lot of opposition. Nobody came up and said, make them stay at two. And we heard that last time. 
So I think we have an agreement on the eight. I think you can build some beautiful homes. I think you'll make a lot of money. It's such a nice place to live. So um, I, I'll wait and see what your commissioner comes back with. He seems like he's got a few things that he's worked through at this meeting. So um, I, I think you, we're gonna get to a place where you, you'll be able to build. But again, some of those probably aren't necessary with only eight homes that were necessary with the 16 to 20. So that's my comments, Madam Chair. Commissioner Lober. I really don't, really don't wanna see you get shot down this evening. And my thought is if, if you're amenable, uh, I'd be inclined to move to continue this out some period of time. Would a couple months be enough, or do you need longer? Okay, so what, what could we do, if I, if I may ask staff, in terms of a uh, couple months out? So, so a couple of months out would be the December 5th meeting. That would... would that work for you, Mr. Moya? Okay, I'll go ahead and make it a motion to continue this out to December 5th. I have a motion by Commissioner Lober, a second by Commissioner Smith. Any more discussion on the issue? Madam Chair. Commissioner Tobias? Can, can we uh, direct staff, if possible, to provide us with what information we would have uh, concerning septic tanks of all varieties that are in the coastal high hazard area? I don't, I don't even if you want me to make it part of the motion, I will. I don't know that it's necessary, okay. though. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Okay, since no one else wants to say anything, I think, you know, this isn't my district, so I'm not gonna speak too harshly against Commissioner Tobia. However, I think, you know, if this was how Commissioner Tobia felt, maybe a meeting with, with you guys would have, would have, you know, possibly produced more fruit and you could have moved forward. I don't think, I think it's a completely, and I think Commissioner Lober said it best before I had a chance to, it's completely unfair to any property owner, whether it be a development of eight houses or a development of 300, to, to put an unfair burden on them saying you have to have an advanced system when others do not. Now, if the county commission wants to change their policy, that's fine, I'm willing to look at that. But I think that given the fact that there are several empty lots within that same area that would develop, that we would not require them to have the system and they would probably have a larger impact on the drainage than a house with two and a half acres would have. I, I don't think we're being very consistent. I think we're being impassioned and I think we're talking about hypotheticals that were very clearly had to be drug out of staff to come up with to how this mate possibly could have maybe in a high 100 year storm effect. The coastal the, uh, um, conservation, high coastal high hazard area is more to the, the infrastructure than it is to the lagoon. So I think if we're gonna come back with an opinion, we better be sure what we're saying before we start restricting without change in policy. Again, I'm, I'm willing to look at the policy, I'm willing to talk about the policy, I'm willing to, but we can't, we can't just say arbitrarily that this is, this is an unfair burden we're gonna put on a developer because of hypothetical. That's, that's reckless and I think that that's grounds for appeal if you guys actually wanted to sue this commission. And because this is a public hearing and because it's based on testimony of fact, I don't think hypotheticals work for policies that we don't have in place. Understanding of course that BDPs often offer concessions. I think the fact that you know a two and a half, I think people get a little impassioned and a little confused when you use the term development. Because development, you assume a big PUD on these little quarter acre lots and it's, it's you know, this high density. These are two and a half acre lots. And most of the residents, the opposition that we heard was the reduction in density, which you, you addressed. So I think, I don't know, that's just how I feel about it. I think, um, you know, in order for me to support any further restrictions, I would have to either have a change in policy or some real science instead of hypotheticals. Commissioner Tobias. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chairwoman, just a couple things you brought up, an issue I just need to re respond. Um, I, I don't need to, but it, the way the lobbying works, my office is always open, and it's the job of people that are concerned in making change to come see the, in, in my office, the way we handle things, to come see the elected official. Uh, Shell Woods had contacted my office on numerous occasions. She's come in on numerous occasions. I make my office uh, uh, very aware. In all honesty, if I was a lobbyist and I was interested in developing a piece of property that may have some uh, issues with constituents, I think, again, I've never been a lobbyist and I've never tried to do this, I think common sense would be call up the commissioner and say, hey, let's have a meeting. It's not my job 
to seek the counsel of people that are trying to uh, come forward. And uh, so whether you're listening or not, the residents figured it out. Certainly the lobbyists uh, did not. And as far as grounds for appeal, uh, my suggestion would be seek counsel uh, if, if that there's competent counsel behind you. Uh, certainly don't take the opinions of, of folks that uh, 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 have not passed uh, the bar nor gone to law school. Okay, and while I would agree with that sentiment, the fact of the matter is is that this applicant was before this board before, and we did talk about terms, and when those terms appear to change, I know my office, if I had additional questions, I would have reached out to the applicant because ultimately I want to come to a solution and not send you back again to, to delay it because if it's a good solution for all, then it's a good solution for all, and that's the bottom line. Um, and as far as you know, grounds for appeal, again, I've been at this for a while, and I've seen it, and I just suggested that that was a risk or that was an exposure that this commission um, was, was, you know, it's, it applies to this commission because I've seen it and I've lived it. So with that, I'll call the question on Commissioner Lober's original motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I don't know, you guys, some of you look confused. It's just gonna come back to us in a couple of months. I'll let everybody kind of give them a second to walk out. <laughs> Anybody need a break? Okay. You guys need a going. break? Okay. I mean, if you want, but I'm okay. Just making sure. You good to keep going? All right, item H6. Revard Medical City LLC requests the transmittal of a large scale comprehensive plan amendment to change the future land use designation from planned industrial to community commercial. It's located in District 4 on the east side of North Wickham Road, approximately 748 feet north of Jordan Blast Boulevard. On September 9th, 2019, the local planning agency heard the request and unanimously recommended approval. <coughs> Mr. Lee. Good evening, Rob Lee with Lee Engineering in the Atlantic. I'm representing my client, Brevard Medical City LLC, in this request to change uh, the future land use plan from plant industrial to community commercial. Um, it's the first step necessary for us to follow up with the PUD to allow for some uh, independent living facility and, and an expanded uh, assisted living facility. And we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Commissioner Lover? I've got one. This isn't going to affect how I vote on this, but I'm just too curious not to ask. Sure. Uh, back in April, we had an agenda item on this, the same spot that indicated it was a 120 room assisted living facility. The current one talks about adding 40 beds to raise it from 96 to 136 beds. Any, any idea which is accurate, the April one or this one? It, it doesn't matter as far as my vote, I'm just curious based on the discrepancy. I'm sorry, sir. If you don't have it handy, it's not the end of the world. Um, I'm just, I'm just curious. Okay. Well, right now, um, that's a, that's a general um, amount of units. Uh, it's all going to be figured out in the site planning stages after during the PUD process. Um, it's, it'll be a hundred units for the independent living facility. The owner is, is good with that amount. And I believe it's an increase of 40 beds over the originally approved assisted living facility. So that would be 40 more assisted living beds and 100 rooms for the independent living facility. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Commissioner Smith, to district. Yeah, I'm going to move to uh, approve this. Second. And right. 
Let me just say that I had some concern about the addition of the units, and my concern was traffic on that section of Wickham Road, but staff has assured me that it does not pose a problem, so that's why I'm in favor of it. Thank you, sir. All right. I don't have any cards on this, any public comment cards, surprisingly, right, after all that last <laughs> issue. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item H7. Oh, no, that was withdrawn, right? Yeah. Madam Chair, items eight and nine will be read into together uh, since there are companion applications. So item eight is JSFS Land Trust, Jacob and Faye Shapiro, trustees applicant. Kim Rosenka requests approval of a small-scale comprehensive plan Amendment to change the future land use designation from Thank residential you. four to residential six. Yes, Item number nine is JSFS Land Trust Jacob and Faye Shapiro trustees. Applicant Kim Rosenka requests approval of a change of zoning classification from rural residential mobile home to RA-2-6 single family attached residential. It's located in district one on the north side of Ranch Road. On August 5th, 2019, the local planning agency voted five to three to approve this CPA. On August 5th, 2019, the planning and zoning board voted six to two to approve the request with a binding development plan limited to maximum of 49 units. On September 25th, 2019, the applicant submitted the attached draft BDP. Staff, as of today, sent the applicant our comments. Okay. Uh, good evening, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the County Commission. My name is Kim Rosenka. I am with the law firm of Cantwell and Goldman, PA, in Cocoa Village. I am here with the developer, Paco Nagero of Soho Development, Soho One Development LLC. He just had to run outside, and Sid Shahayeb, who is the engineer of record. Uh, as you can see from the aerial on page 568 of your packet, it's also at 616. Uh, this is the only undeveloped land in the area that's residential. Um, to the north of it is conservation land, and then you get the city of Titusville. This is approximately 9.79 acres. It's heavily wooded. There are over six acres of wetlands on this almost 10-acre parcel. It has never been developed. It's had a history of sales, but no development. It was sold in 77, 2004, 2009. It's currently under contract with Soho One Development, LLC. The initial plan was to build duplexes. Once the wetland survey, initial wetland survey was done, they found out there was too many wetlands to do that. That's when the project was changed to townhomes, which is single family homes, as you know, it's not multifamily. It is currently RRH1 zoning, which is one unit to acre of mobile homes, and it has a um, future land use of Res 4. We're asking for a Res 6, an RA26, so townhomes can be built and clustered to make the project viable. Um, the package I provided to you, I know this is in different places in your, in your agenda, but it's gotten, your agenda's gotten so big, I figure it's easier to provide it to you again. Page one uh, is the concept plan that's been provided, and it's also to be attached to the binding development plan. Um, the north is to the, to the right side. As you can see, uh, there's proposed seven buildings with seven units. There will be a little clubhouse and a pond, retention ponds. The access is going to have to impact some wetlands, but as you know, we're limited to impact on wetlands. It accesses to the south onto an unpaved county road, ranch road. The way it's designed right now, it crosses to Falk Avenue, which I understood was a paved road, but I'm indicating in the staff report it might not be paved, but it is to me paved. And then Falk Road goes out to Everett that goes out to Grissom Parkway. Um, that's not the desired access, so we met with staff on September 19th to review county standards, and the binding development plan resulted to allow the developer to improve Ranch Road. So that will be improved to the project entrance. The hope is for 49 uh, townhomes, likely only 48 because of the acreage if this is passed. The binding development plan will limit, even though we've asked for a Res 6, we're limiting it to a little less than five units to the acre. The sales price should be approximately 250000 to 300000 for each unit. There is city water on Ranch Road. The developer will bring sewer to the property and will improve Ranch Road if the density is increased to Res 6. 
as requested in the binding development plan. Starting on page two of my packet is the binding development plan. Based upon uh, Mr. Calkins' comments, we have revised it um, pretty much in conformity with what he suggested. He pointed out that we had agreed to limit the small area on the, um, the west of the property, marked 425, that we would leave it undeveloped. So that's been added as paragraph five. Paragraph four has been changed mostly as Mr. Calkins suggested. However, he had asked that we take out the last sentence in paragraph four, the developer owner may be entitled to transportation impact fee credits or reimbursement, I added, for the cost of engineering, permitting, and construction. While staff at this point looks at this as a site-related improvement, we do not. We do not believe we have to. This is what was called a concession. Uh, we believe that the developer does have access to a paved road, as required by county code, to Falk Avenue. However, it does make more sense to have the access on Ranch Road, so it's a concession for the increase in density that the developer will pave about 1,600 or 1,700 lineal feet of Ranch Road for access. Whether or not we can get impact fee credits or reimbursements, we have to come back to you anyway. I just didn't want it to be left out there that we weren't still seeking them because we believe we will. This road could cost easily still $300,000, $400,000 to improve because we have to move. We have to, we have to move um, power lines and other things on this road that have been there for a long time. Uh, so, uh, um, also, just for reference, I have in the packet at page eight and page nine, the transportation impact fee issues, what are capital improvements, we believe that this meets it, and then also the section 62815 on page nine that deals exactly with um, credits and reimbursements, I, just for informational purposes. We met with the residents at a meeting on June 25th of 2019, and there were approximately close to 40 residents there, and they were rightly you know, interested and concerned about what was going on next to their property. They were concerned about traffic. Again, this will go on to Ranch Road, goes on to Grissom Parkway. Grissom <coughs> Parkway will have no decrease in, in um, service. They were worried about buffering and privacy. Again, this is clustered. There's only nine or 10 homes that will even see these townhomes. It's gonna have at least a 25 foot buffer. And then there's a uh, 20 foot buffer from the property owner surrounding it due to their zoning category. The property values, there's no evidence this will occur. As I've said, these will sell for 250,000 to 300,000. The recent sales in the Cypress Woods area, which is the development that surrounds this property, have run anywhere from 148,000 to 300,000 in the past two years. The access issue, again, that's on the site, that will be a site plan issue, and we now have it on Ranch Road, not going through the neighborhood subdivision to the south. And drainage was also a concern uh, because this has historically been where property drains to. And as you all know, under 623202 on page 10 of this packet, the drainage of the property shall not alter the established drainage so as to adversely affect the adjoining property. And this won't either, but that is a site plan issue with stormwater, as you all know. Uh, this is a unique property. It's the last undeveloped. There's a reason it's undeveloped, because it's hard to develop. Um, this will provide a housing choice of townhomes. There's nothing like it in this area. There is to the north in Titusville but not in this part of the county. Your future land use element 14 states that zoning regulations should allow for a variety of housing types while providing residents with a choice in terms of residential locations, and this will do just that. The requests, one is a comprehensive plan amendment. Um, there has been some current concern that this doesn't match with one of your policies because it's not a transition zone, it's not next to other Res 6. However, your land development code says that comprehensive plans can be amended with the procedures established by state statute. State statutes that I found, including 163-3231, 163-3194, say that the land development regulations, permits, and orders have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Otherwise, you'd never be able to amend your comprehensive plan. There's nothing that states that I could find in the Florida statute, and Ms. Bentley may know better than this, but I couldn't find it. Um, that states comprehensive plan amendments must be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Otherwise, you're going into a circular pattern that, that no amendments would ever occur. The comp plan amendment is a legislative planning decision. The comprehensive plan is a general guideline for the growth of the community. There's no way in 1988 that anyone even thought about this little parcel of property 
and what would be needed here to make it developable. As to the rezoning, uh, this is a peculiar property because of the wetlands. That's something for you to consider in determining a reasonableness of the zoning classification. The mere fact it hasn't been developed is um, akin to a change of circumstances. There's case law out there that says lack of development is a reason for rezoning if it can't be developed any other way. And this is infill development. I had this discussion at planning and zoning. Your code doesn't define infill development. So on page 11 and page 12, I just found some things I found on the internet about what infill is. I think we all know what it is, but it's a development of vacant parcels within previously built areas. That's on page 10 and page 11. Again, these aren't from our state. I couldn't find anything really that was too helpful, but it does talk about, um, about the American Planning Association on that first one. And then the second one, the infill development, I have some things highlighted. Um, an increased emphasis on developing past over parcels within developed areas and on maximizing use of existing public facilities, which is water and sewer. There's already power lines down there as well. And new infill development can often lead to some benefit that may have been missing from a neighborhood, such as some increase in density to help support more frequent transit service. Again, this gives a different type of housing unit, still single family, and it also will result in the improvement of a portion of Ranch Road. If you go down Ranch Road, there's seven or eight houses that do access on directly to Ranch Road. Then if you go over 95, there's hundreds and hundreds of developable acres that you know, one day likely will be um, developed and they'll have a, a start on Ranch Road. So again, this will result in a partial construction of Ranch Road can be used also to the subdivision to the south. They'll have an extra access now to Falk Avenue they didn't have before, and it will allow the property to be developed. With that, I would request approval of the comprehensive plan amendment to Res 6 and the rezoning to RA 2-6. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have questions for Ms. Rosanka now? Yes. Okay. If it's all right, ma'am. Certainly. Okay, so I, I have a, a few questions for you here. Um, First off, looking at the east side, just simply because that's where you have the most development, the three buildings uh, that are roughly north of, of center, at least start maybe right around center and move north, the buffer to the east of the edge of those buildings, were you saying 20 foot? It has to be at least 25 foot to the edge of the property, and then I was saying it was 20 foot going to the setback to the other building. So there, okay. it's just from a neighbor's house to the building will at least be 45 feet. Again, this hasn't been site planned. These are just concept plans. I just want to make sure I'm still on board. Yes. Um, next question for you. I appreciate the information with respect to Ranch Road, but putting Ranch Road aside for the moment, there's certainly some adjoining and nearby streets. What is the situation with those streets? Are they paved? Are they unpaved? Are they likely to face traffic from this? Um, well, Falk Avenue is paved. It goes to Everett Street, which is also paved, which goes to Grissom. I don't think so. I think this development would use Ranch Road if it's available and paved because it'll be a nicer road because those are older roads. They're not in the best of shape. There's no lining. There's no, I mean, there's no line down the middle. There's no shoulders. There's no, I don't think there's even sidewalks. And then next up, with respect to the cover sheet on the agenda item here, it talks about the applicant having an intent to provide sewer. Do you know whether sewer is going to be hooked up? Is yes, it something that- Yes, they have to. Okay. They, they will have That's to. Good. And then the last one, hardest, I saved the, the toughest one for last. Um, one of the folks that I met with for my staff briefing called this a lake of Res 6 and an ocean of Res 4. I said, well, maybe it's a pond of Res 6 and an ocean of Res 4. What do you think in terms of how this really fits in with the nearby area? How, how is it that Res 6 is consistent in your mind? Well, the only reason Res 6 is consistent is to get the townhomes, to get the clustering, to make a piece of property that's not developable, make it developable because of the cost of the road, because of the cost of the uh, amazing amount of roads they're going to have to put in there just to get to it. They're going to have to build it up not to impact the wetlands. So uh, again, comp uh, spot zoning doesn't really apply to comprehensive plans. Um, and if there are reasons to do it from a legislative policy, right. it's fairly debatable to allow this to happen, to get the concession of the road, then I think it's viable for the commission to approve this. Realistically, I, I don't know that anyone, and I, I may be wrong, but I, I've not, I don't believe that anyone necessarily has any issue with multifamily, but I think it's the Res 6 bump that's causing perhaps at least my consternation with it. 
Um, is this something that you think just simply won't be economically feasible to do multifamily with, keeping it at Res 4? The, the client doesn't think so. Again, and, and when we first looked at this road as a $1.2 million road to build it to full county standards, so that's where the problem came in. And it's just difficult, just even the, the wetlands survey, just the surveying of this property is expensive. So. No, they don't. And it's single family. It's not multifamily. It's single family. Oh, attached. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. But that, that's a common misconception. It's going to be single ownership. It's not going to be rented out to anyone who comes down the road who wants like an apartment. So it, it's single family. They're going to be single family ownership. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you for the clarification. Yeah. Commissioner Pritchett, are you just holding until? Okay. I um, really appreciate that you, you stepped up with the road. I probably like Tad's better um, because he added in there about the range road improvement shall receive a certificate of completion. So you have this one, oh, right? Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I forgot that. Yes, I agree. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, and and this then goes also, back to you all. I, I, on yours, too, I, I don't want to, I want to strike out the word or allow paved access. I think it has to be paved access. I think that was just a typo. So if you look at that, that would be good. But let me tell you what I got here. One, I love the townhomes. I do. And when you first told me about this, I thought, okay, cool, if we fix it, because you said clustered. Now, look, they're kind of clustered close to the neighborhood. So let me tell you my struggle, so maybe you can think through this. And again, I haven't heard from everybody, and I haven't got to talk to you yet. I, we've been kind of going back and forth working stuff. But I do struggle with the rest six, unless we have some parameters in place that's going to cause no harm to the surrounding properties. And I, I think that can happen, but we're going to have to figure out how. Let me ask you this. Is this single story, or is this? Two story. Two stories. So what's the uh, height that you're going to? Well, the max we can do is 35 feet. Is that what you're planning on? They don't know yet. It's, okay. it has, they haven't been designed yet. Okay. So my struggle with that, you're so close to the houses and it's up high and those are single level houses behind it. So I'm just telling you what, I, what I'm, I'm struggling with. If they would have all been in the center, we'd be good to go, but you've got all that wet. So I don't know if you could you mitigate all of those things with- We, we can't mitigate wetlands at all. We can't housing. do anything. No, so, only for access. So I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time with that. Right now you have a res four and it's manufacturing with nine. And to do this, we're gonna end up with 49. So if we're gonna pull this off with 49, you know, we're gonna have to work very hard together to come up with something creative. Cause again, I do have a lot of heartburn for the surrounding people around there. And thank you for changing from Everett because I, I thought 490 trips up and down on that road every day is just not fair to that little road. So this is good that we're doing this, but I also have all these homes in behind it and they've been bumped up to a, a zoning that only was gonna allow nine homes that were manufactured. There was never gonna be two story. And now they gotta be concerned with maybe your two or three story right behind their houses. I mean, those are right on top. And then you guys aren't gonna put up any buffer. So I'm, I need to hear from you and the residents, but I'm just being fair with you up front with what my struggles are right now, right. so. Well, but if there was four units to the acre, so in <laughs> theory it could have been the same zoning they had, RU113, which allows a 35 foot height as well. So, I mean, they, they could have 35 feet anywhere in, in Cypress Woods. They're allowed to. So yeah, this but, more. but we're building townhomes right behind their houses. Right, right. And, and, and before again, it could only have been manufactured homes. So this, this, is, a, this is significant. So I, you know, I'm going to have to continue hearing from you. I'm just telling you up front what I'm struggling with. And I'm, I'm just trying to explain. They, they, they can only do what they can do with the limited impact. I mean, I know. we know where the wetlands I are, know. and we know they have to have roads. I, I really know. This is a really wet piece of property. I really get it. And you're trying to find a creative thing. But I'm, I'm just letting you know up front. Right. So this is what I'm going to try to work through tonight. Right. I, I understand. But in theory, they could put a 35-foot home right there. Who? And, I mean, if they wanted to to get regular zoning, RU113. I mean, it could have 35 feet. We're at, Ms. Rizanko, we're talking about. On the property at issue. On the I mean, property you're talking yeah, about right the, now? The next, next door zoning is RU113. And this is Res4, and they could go to RU113. I think that would be imminently compatible, and they could have a 35-foot home there. Yeah, but it would it would just be one home, and there would only right. be nine on the property. So we we are bringing a lot of density. And again, I really want this to work. So I'm waiting to hear from the residents. If you've got lot 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26 here, and they're saying that won't bother me a bit, I'm probably going to get a little more comfortable. But I, again, I, I don't want to cause any harm. I do want you to be able to do this project, but I am struggling with that Res 6 transitional property here because I'm not real sure 
this is the best zoning, but I, again, I understand why you picked it because it'll work if we can make this work. But th this is really complicated. I'm really hoping we're creative and, and can find a way to work it. But right now, there's a lot we're going to have to work through. But I really kudos you for working on the road portion because that was my, my number one thing that I thought was going to hinder things. And you worked very hard on that. And I appreciate it. All right. We'll Thank call them up and then you can come back up and Thank you. rebut. Chris Clements. And after Chris, Roland Hudson. Hi, state your name, name and address, please. Yes, uh, Christine Clements, uh, 5522 Yelp and Holly, resident of Cypress Woods. Um, today, I just wanted to make more general comments. Um, I have not uh, seen, I guess, the final plan. Um, today I wasn't even sure if it was going to be on the agenda. I came to a couple of meetings where it was tabled. Um, and I know that you indicated more specific type things, but these are my feelings. Um, as a resident of uh, Cypress Woods, uh, as you know and have stated that that is a single family zoned community that will back up to this property on Ranch Road. I feel that the rezoning application should not be approved for the requested RA26 designation so that 49 single family attached units, I think I'm saying that correctly, can be built on this property. The reasons I feel this way are all the surrounding homes are zoned residential four level, therefore it is not consistent with the surrounding landscape. I feel a multifamily type zoning does not belong in the Port St. John community. It does not exist other places. I'm very concerned about the impact on the wetlands and on any heritage trees that may be on the property. Much of the property is really muck, and I thought that this uh, was part of it, a special flood hazard area, which could not be developed. Um, so the developer is trying to make up by building more homes on a reduced amount of land so it can be a profitable venture for him seven buildings, seven per unit, tw two stories, a pool, community center. It's too much for that parcel of land. I am concerned that the runoff and the drainage will impact our community in Cypress Woods and other surrounding Ranch Road residents. I feel a building cannot, the builder cannot guarantee the impact won't be felt by other local residents. I'm concerned about the traffic and the trips generated in and out. And I mean, it's nice that they will pave Ranch Road because that is kind of an eyesore and it's not a good road. But I can't believe if you're going to have seven buildings, seven units, everybody has three cars, you know, how much more traffic that and noise level will be impacted in our area. Um, in addition, I was a little confused, M&R, uh, who was going to build a warehouse. I, I'm, I'm confused now. That was taken off. It was tab not table, but withdrawn. We were going to, within the small proximity, have a warehouse there in this area. And I don't know if that was taken off the table completely or it just means that they're not asking for the BU2 zoning. So in this area, we have a lot going on. Um, this, uh, also in this small area, about a block away, this is what I was repeating, we were going to have a warehouse and of course they requested a higher zoning and I'm not sure whether or not that's still going to continue but again a lot's going on in this area. Also my understanding is that now there's a small area study group looking at Port St. John future development and I think very serious consideration should be given to this request before I said these requests because I thought with the warehouse and this in order to make sure that Port St. John manages its growth properly and for it to be the best for the community to maintain its small town feel and character. Um, it's not Titusville, it's not Vieira. Thank you. Thank you. Roland, and after Roland, Linda Donahue, or Donahoe. Roland Hudson, I live at uh, 5230 Everett Street. Can you pull Street. the mic down? Just so, yes, yeah, so you don't have to lean over. I live at 5230 Everett Street. Uh, Falk Road is right beside my lot. It's only at the most 200 feet long and it has been paved but it's 
maybe half of it is, is not there anymore. But my biggest concern was that the paving of Ranch Road. And they have said they would do that. So that's, that's the only thing I had to say. There's a lot of traffic on that road. Thank you. Linda? And it's Donahoe, so you have it right. Okay. I'm Linda Donahoe. I'm the uh, president of Cypress Woods HOA. I'm not here to speak as the president of Cypress Woods HOA. I'm a resident, but I've got uh, several opinions from the homeowners. We have 305 homes there. Uh, the ones that are going to be affected the most are the ones that's having these houses backed up. So you have one-story houses. You know, we're all on the same level, and now you're going to have a townhouse overlooking their backyards. Some of them have swimming pools in their backyards. You know, how would you like it if you had your neighbor looking out your window and you're in your pool? You know, it's just that's a big concern for the neighborhood. The other um, main concern is the drainage. When it rains, it pours, <laughs> and we have floods. We have lots of floods, and it's mainly back there on that ranch road is um, where the flooding is. So that's a big concern. They have a canal that supposedly all the stuff runs into all the floodwaters. They don't keep it cleaned out. And it's got trash in there. It's got all kinds of things in there. So you add more houses and more water flowing in there and more everything. Now you're really going to, just the last storm we had two years ago, our roads were flooded. You couldn't get in and out of our homes. And Ranch Road was, our Range Road was worse. You know, you can ask the residents. It was terrible. So you throw more homes, you know, and now you're, going into that um what's it called where you have the uh, wetlands they're going to run their entrance right into the middle of the wetlands there which i'm assuming they're going to have to pave that so what's that going to do with drainage um you know it's a big drainage is a big thing that we're really really concerned with on top of the uh, distance between the houses in the townhouses, and we don't want to have, you know, these people paid a lot of money for those houses. You know, it's not like your normal everyday house. These are, you know, very nice. It's a very nice neighborhood, and they want to keep it that way. And we don't want to have, um, uh oh, my time's up. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, I forgot to start your clock. I oh, apologize. okay. We don't want to have. So you we probably would. got some extra time, but I'd rather give you a little extra than not enough. So. We're concerned with, um, you know, degrading our homes, you know, with having that, you know, and how is that going to affect our, our houses and, and the cost of our houses. And, you know, if you got a townhouse in your backyard overlooking your yard, you know, and things of that nature. But I think that most everybody has already addressed most of the concerns. As far as the townhouses go, I don't know if it's that big of a concern if they weren't in our backyard. You know what I'm saying? If they weren't overlooking our pools and our homes, but they are. Plus the drainage issue is two of the main concerns that everybody has. But all right, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have um, the owner and the applicant cards. Do you guys want to come up? Or are you just available for comment or? Okay. We're going to take a five minute break um, so Rita can speak with um, the attorney and stuff. So we're going to adjourn for five to ten minutes. <laughs>